Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is the past, the present, and the future of quantum cognition. Um, and this work has been supported by a National Science Foundation and the Office of Scientific Research. So let me begin with a statement by some important person. <clears throat> quantum science teaches us to give up the traditional way of thinking. Note that the traditional nature will make us fixate on a certain point and waste time and energy. Therefore, we must break out of the limitations of the point and explore innovative thinking patterns and look beyond the horizon to embrace uncertainty and pursue higher levels of information processing. Quantum science is the pinnacle of human intelligence, which allows us to explore the most mysterious phenomena in nature. In the field of quantum science, we not only have to observe nature, but also interact with it which will open up unlimited possibilities and opportunities for innovation. So I'll let you think about who, who wrote that statement and maybe later on at the end I'll tell you. Okay, so here's my outline for today. <clears throat> now I'm a cognitive scientist and I work in the field of judgment decision-making, but we're applying principles and mathematics from quantum theory to human judgment decision-making. So, um, you know, quantum theory, of course, was developed in physics, but uh, we can take the mathematics and the principles out of the theory and apply it to other fields. In fact, it's been applied to fields like finance and information and retrieval. And we also apply quantum theory to cognitive science. So first I need to tell you why. Why are we, why are we applying quantum theory to cognitive science? And of course, I, I, I can only spend a little bit of time doing that. Uh, I have some other um, YouTubes that go into that in more depth. But uh, so I'll have one slide that shows you the reason why, or a couple of slides. And then, uh, then I'm going to tell you a little bit, like another couple of slides, what is quantum probability theory? Uh, give you a very brief introduction. And then I'm going to go through some of our past achievements using quantum probability theory and challenges that we met. Now, I was hoping to get, go over quantum dynamics too, but very likely um, get tired and run, it, run out of energy and have to do that some other day. So uh, now this, this talk I'm giving, I'm giving this talk because after we've been doing this work for about 15 years, after 15 years, uh, my colleague Emmanuel Pothos and I have um, um, written a paper that reviews a lot of this work. It's papers published in the annual review of psychology. So this talk is kind of a, a summary of description of ideas in that paper. Now this, this work that I'm gonna present to, to you today is, is mainly the work that has been done by myself and my colleagues. I can't work review all the work that's been done by everybody because well, there's a lot of work out there and, I'm, and I just can't cover all that. So I'm gonna be focusing on my own work, although I will occasionally at different places mention other people's work as well. So why quantum? Well, there's psychological reasons that we um, <clears throat> are interested in using quantum theory. And that can be um, explained by comparing you know, classical measurement theory and quantum measurement theory. In classical theory, you have, a, you have a cognitive system, but it's assumed to be in some kind of definite state with respect to each measure. So like at some point in time, you know, you have some kind of definite preference or utility. And then we take a measure and we measure that, uh, you might measure your similarity or your preference or emotion. And our measurement simply records what existed right before we took the measurement. So right before the measurement, you had some kind of utility and then uh, we measure that utility. Now, quantum systems work quite differently. Instead of just recording what existed, quantum theory, you're in some kind of a, indefinite state before the measurement. So you're, you're, not, you're uncertain about your, your, the outcomes of possible measurements. You're in superposed state concerning these outcomes of these possible measurements. And when we take a measurement, like we ask how similar something is or what's your preference or your emotion, when we take these measurements, uh, the measurement interacts with your indefinite state to create a definite state. So we, we create a state and bring it into existence. We bring into existence a reality that didn't things that wasn't there before. So qu quantum measurement is a very creative act. 
So another reason is contextual reasons. So often in the judgment decision-making, we ask questions, but we ask these questions uh, in context. So we might ask pairs of questions. So here's an example, like this table here represents like say proportion of answers where we ask the question A and X. Question A is, do you think the social and economic state of the United States is good shape? Question X is, do you, do you think the president of the United States is doing a good job? So we might ask the, the, A in the context of X, but we could also ask A in the context of Y. So A would be, do you think the social economic state of the United States is good shape? And Y might be, well, do you think the president of China is doing a good job? And so we have these different contexts. And what we, and what we often find in judgment and decision-making is that uh, the meaning of a question changes depending on the context of, of the question. So if you're asking A in the context of X, A, A develops one meaning. But if we ask A in the context of Y, it can develop a different meaning. And this, this contextual changing, change of meaning uh, produces violations of classic probability theory so that, there's, so that uh, it becomes not possible to reconstruct these, these different tables from these different contexts by a single sample space with a single joint distribution. So these contextual reasons is a second reason why we um, are interested in quantum modeling. Quantum models were especially designed for these contextual effects. So now let's turn to uh, what is quantum probability theory? So, um, yeah, we have to do this very briefly because uh, you could take a whole course on quantum probability theory, but, uh, but well, let's do it within one page, <laughs> five minutes. So, and let's do this by comparing classic probability theory and quantum theory. Now, everybody, if you ever have had a course in statistics or you're doing some kind of cognitive modeling or you're working with stochastic processes, you're working with classical probability theory, most likely. And um, now, of course, classical, classical probability theory was developed in, let's say, the um, uh, 17th century or the 18th century, but it wasn't, and it was developed, you know, to solve classical, you know, problems in classical physics, like statistical, you know, statistical physics, thermodynamics, but. Um, but the classical theory, the probability theory wasn't axiomatized until 1932 by Kolmogorov. So Kolmogorov put down some formal axioms that provide, provided the foundation for a foundation for classical probability theory. Now, quantum theory, of course, was developed in the 1920s by some brilliant physicists, and it was, it was developed to, to explain some puzzling phenomena that occurred in physics that couldn't be explained by classical physics. But uh, later, in 1932, von Neumann axiomatized quantum theory. Now, by axiomatizing quantum theory, uh, he lifted the, the theory out, out of physics and put it in, a, in an abstract domain where it could be used by other fields. And so, in fact, like I said, quantum theory is being used in quantum physics and quantum information retrieval, and we're using it in quantum cognition. But so classical theory is based upon the Kolmogorov axioms, and quantum theory is based upon the von Neumann axioms. So they're two very general probability theories, but they're based on different axioms. They're both very general. In fact, some people think quantum theory is more general than classical theory, but you can, that's a debate that we don't need to go into. But they are based on different axioms. So we'll look at these axioms very briefly, kind of uh, briefly, and we can describe these, these axioms in terms of these, these four four principles. So first of all, you know, both classical theory and quantum theory work in some kind of space. So let's talk about the space. Well, before we talk about the space, let's give an example problem to put this space in context. So uh, one of the famous uh, judgment fallacies, probability, probability judgment fallacies, is uh, the, the what we call the conjunction fallacy. This was first discovered by Tversky and Kahneman, 1980s, and I'll be talking about that more later. But let me just give an example of a conjunction fallacy. So what they Tversky and Kahneman did is they give participants these were Stanford students, you know, uh, probability judgment problems. So first they told them a story to give them some information. So this is the Linda story. So they say, Linda, 
is a woman, uh, she, was, she graduated from UC Berkeley in philosophy and she was active in social movements in the 1980s. So that's Linda. That's your inf prior information about Linda. And then you're asked, which event is more likely? Uh, the first event is this bank teller event. Do you think Linda is a bank teller? Well, that event doesn't seem very likely given the story about Linda. And then the second event that you'd ask is, well, is Linda a feminist and a bank teller? So it's a conjunction event. Now, it turns out these Stanford students, most of them intuitively judge that the second event, feminist and bank teller, seemed more likely than bank teller. But as we'll see from classic probability theory, that's not possible with classic probability theory, but it turns out it is possible with quantum theory. So it depends on what axioms you're using, that could be a fallacy or not. So anyway, if we take a look at this uh, classical theory, classical theory begins with a sample space. So here we have a sample space, let's say that we're thinking about for this Linda problem. These are like different individuals. These dot, each dot might be a different individual, a different element in the sample space, a different point in the sample space. So, so, so classical theory uses this notion of a, a set, a universal set of possible points. And each point is a, a member of this universal set. And quantum theory instead works with a vector space. So instead of a sample space, a set of points, we have a vector space, which is a, uh, like a set of dimensions. You want that span of vector space. So we replace the, a set theory of points with the vector space. Now, an event in classical theory is a subset. So this red circle here contains the subset containing all the points that are feminists. These are all women that are feminist, different women that are feminists. And this blue circle is all these maybe different uh, women that are uh, bank tellers. And the intersection is an event. That's the, that's, the, that's the intersection between feminists and bank tellers, that gray area. <clears throat> so, so events in classical theory are subsets, whereas events in, in quantum theory are subspaces. So here we have a, 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 a plane contained within this three-dimensional vector space. This plane is kind of oblique, let's say, with respect to this other plane. This, this upper plane is the feminist plane, represent the feminist event. This lower plane is the uh, bank teller plane. So these two planes represent two events, the two subspaces in the, sub, in the vector space, and they're oblique planes with respect to each other. So those are events. Events in uh, quantum theory are subspaces like planes or, or higher dimensional hyperplanes and things. And so in classical probability theory, we have a state and the state is a, is a probability function. It's a probability function, the function assigns probabilities to events. So it's gonna assign a measure, a probability measure to this set. It's gonna assign a probability measure to this set and it's gonna assign a probability measure to the intersection. Now, the thing about classical probability theory is the probability measure for the intersection has to be smaller than the probability measure sound assigned to the entire bank teller event. Because feminist and bank teller, this gray area is contained within the bank teller event. And so the probability of feminist bank teller has to be smaller than the probability of bank teller. And so that's why judging this to be more likely is called a probability fallacy, because according to these axioms, of, of classical probability theory, that's a fallacy. You can't have this. It's got to be a lower probability. The quantum theory, it's a possibility. So in quantum theory, a state is a vector sitting in this vector space. So this size, this, this black arrow, is this vector representing the state that you have. So you hear the story about Linda, and that gives you a vector in this vector space that represents your beliefs. So here's your beliefs after the story about Linda. Now, if you're asked that she's a bank teller, you're gonna take your vector in this vector space and project it down onto the subspace for bank teller. You project it down here in this line, this kind of faint yellow line here, shorter yellow line here in the bank teller's subspace is your projection from the story directly on the bank teller. And it's a short projection, so it's a low probability. But if we take the other event, feminist and bank teller, to get that event, that sequence of events, we first project on the feminist subspace, we land here, 
And then we project down onto the bank teller subspace and we land here. And we land, that, we land here with the sequence feminist and then bank teller with a larger projection. So the projection feminist and bank teller turns out to be larger than the projection bank teller alone. And so quantum theory produces a larger probability of feminist and bank, can produce a larger probability of feminist and bank teller than bank teller alone. And so that's how quantum theory works. And so, you know, it's a different kind of theory that's based upon subspaces and projection to subspaces. Now, the thing about another aspect about classical versus quantum is these, the inferences that we get from classical probability theory is commutative. So like the event um, feminist and bank teller is the same as the event bank teller and feminist because it's the intersection and the intersection is commutative. Whereas quantum theory, the um, probabilities can be non-commutative. So, you know, we find that if we project first on the feminist and then on the bank teller, we find that we get a higher projection for feminist bank teller. But if we first project on the bank teller and then project, first project on the bank teller and then project back up to feminist, down the bank and back up to feminist, we get a shorter projection. So bank teller feminist is shorter than bank teller, but feminist bank teller is longer than bank teller. So quantum theory is non-commutative. The order matters in quantum theory. And that, 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 that order makes the difference to producing the conjunction fallacy. Okay, so that's the basic theory. Well, that's a, well, we'll take another quick look at the theory in a little bit more detail, but then we can't spend a whole, whole talk on just the theory. So let's take a look at some achievements and challenges. So the first one we'll take a look at is question order effects. You know, non-commutativity is so important in quantum theory, then my goodness, we better have something interesting to say about question order effects. So this is an example of a question order study. It's kind of an interesting one. It's an example from, um, uh, a game playing situation. So we're imagining, so this is a study with, where we have like 77 subjects in one condition and 69 subjects, 77 pairs of subjects playing a game in one condition, 69 pairs of subjects playing a game in another condition. Anyway, um, it, the game is a prisoner's dilemma game. So in this game, you have two players, like say Bill and Sue, you know, and Bill can cooperate or defect and Sue can cooperate or defect. And the payoff I get depends on the combination. In the prisoner's dilemma game, uh, it turns out the dominant response is supposed to be both defect. But we don't need to go into the game theory too much. But what we're really interested in is just empirically what happens. Uh, so now what the thing that Tesser did that's interesting is he asked people to not only decide do they want to cooperate or defect, but also make a prediction about what you think your opponent's going to do. So Bill, you know, in this act first case, in this act first condition, Bill first decides himself whether he wants to cooperate or defect. Then after he makes his action de decision, he then predicts what Sue's gonna do. Is Sue gonna cooperate or defect? And so this probability here, point, this probability here point four represents the case where 40% uh, of the participants, when they first decided the action, 40% decided to cooperate and then predicted the opponent would cooperate. Or this cell here, 0.12, 12% 12, 12 of the people first decided to defect and then predicted the other prone is going to cooperate. And here, 25% uh, first decided to cooperate and then they decided the opponent, they predicted that the opponent's going to defect. So that's this table. Over on this table here, we got the opposite order. So they predict first. So they're starting in the column first. So in this case here, 25%. 25% of the people first predicted that the opponent's going to cooperate, and then they decided to cooperate, or this cell right here. 15% first this predicted the opponent will cooperate, and then they decided to defect. So that's the table where you predict first and then act. This is the table you act first and then predict. And so if we look at the total number of cooperations when you act first, when, they, when people act first and then think about prediction later, uh, most of the people want to cooperate. 65% of the people want to cooperate when they, want, when they decide to they act first. But if they make a prediction first, and we, and we ignore the prediction, but just pull across the prediction and look at the probability that they'll cooperate when they predicted first, it goes down to 0.42. So when they act first, they, they prefer to cooperate. But when they predict first, they, they prefer to defect. So we get this big reversal in, in their preferences, depending upon if they predicted or not. And so that's a big order effect 
that you get in this kind of game situation. Later, I'll talk about this table of over here in the corner, but now I'll put that off later. Okay, so let's let's briefly take a look at a quantum model again, and we'll, and then we'll stop going through the theory, theory so much. But let's take it. How does quantum model produce these kind of order effects? So here we have a very simple quantum model. This is called a toy model. But anyway, so let's suppose we're first, you know, looking at Bill's predictions. So Bill's making prediction about Sue. So he's forming beliefs about Sue. So he might have a strong belief uh, prediction that Sue's going to cooperate, or he might have a medium prediction that she's going to cooperate, or he might be uncertain, or he might have immediate me, medium prediction she's going to defect, or he might have a strong prediction that she's going to defect. So maybe she, these, these five degrees of belief about that Bill has about Sue. And so we have these ampl, what are called amplitudes in these cells. These are potentials for each one of these, these uh, beliefs for Bill about Sue. And the squared amplitude gives you the probability of that belief that Bill has about Sue. So these, these squared amplitudes sum up to one. Now this is just an example of what we call five-dimensional model, five-dimensional space. We could have a hundred dimensional space and have a hundred degrees of belief, but we're just using five dimensions for simplicity. Okay, so that's the state vector. You know, that's just like this, this, this arrow sitting out here in space, but it's five dimensional instead of three dimensional. That's the arrow, that's, the, that's Bill's beliefs. And then we're going to project it onto a sub, subspace. So the subspace is, this, is, is produced, is mapped, is determined by this projector. So this projector is going to do the job of mapping this state onto the subspace. So this, this, this matrix defines the subspace that we're using to describe cooperation prediction. So, you know, we want to pick, basically, we want to pick up the first coordinate and the second coordinate, because those are both, you know, beliefs that Sue's going to cooperate. Now this third coordinate, we don't know, so we'll leave that at point, square root of 0.5. When then we square it, we're gonna get 0.5. So, so we're, this is gonna map onto your beliefs about uh, believing that Sue's gonna cooperate, prediction that Sue's gonna cooperate. And so what we do is we take our state, our belief, our vector, we project it onto the subspace for cooperation and we get the projection and we get the squared length of that projection. And that gives us our probability that Bill believes that Sue's gonna cooperate. That's the prediction. Anyway, and so we set up this vector so we can account for Bill's uh, beliefs about Sue. So that's not terribly interesting, but that's how quantum theory works. Now, the things get interesting here is now we want to do something about the action. So the interesting thing about quantum theory is here we have a set of coordinates representing Bill's belief predictions about Sue. These are the, Bill's beliefs about predictions about Sue. And we want to map them into a set of coordinates about Bill's preferences for action. And so we have one distribution over here about beliefs, and we want to kind of and we want to map them into another distribution over here about preferences, about actions. And we're going to do this mapping by this unitary matrix, what we call a unitary operator. And so this, in this unitary matrix, you can think of it as like a, a neural network. And so we got this distribution of activations about beliefs that go through the neural network and it goes through all these connection weights. And the output of the neural network is this distribution of preferences for action. And so this unitary matrix is mapping the inputs into the outputs here. Mathematically, uh, the unitary matrix is multiplied by the uh, belief state to produce the, the action state. So this matrix multiplication produces it too. And so, so, this, so, we're, so we're, we're basically rotating, we're taking this, the belief states and rotating them into action states. And then once we get the action states, we've got Bill's potentials now for the different actions. Uh, we can then look at the, um, uh, this is his state now. Now, now we want to project onto the subspace for, for cooperating. And so we're going to, in the first coordinates here, strong cooperating for preference for cooperating. The second coordinates, medium preference for cooperating. Third one's uncertain. Fourth one's medium preference for defecting, and the fifth one, strong preference for defecting. So we want to pick up the first two. So we got one here and one here to pick up the first two coordinates. And then we got a 0.5 here because you're uncertain. So this gives us a subspace for cooperating. So we take our state here representing Bill's preferences for actions. We project on the subspace representing cooperation actions. And we get the squared length of that projection. And that gives us the probability that Bill's going to 
take a cooperative action. And we design this unitary matrix so we can predict those actions. So maybe that's not terribly interesting because we can fit this matrix to predict those actions. Things that get interesting, however, where things get interesting is where we look at a sequence of, of decisions. So here we have a first sequence. Now we've already built all these, these you know, vectors and operators. Now we can start looking at sequences. So here we're looking at the, the quantum probability. The quantum probability that, um, that uh, Bill predicts Sue will cooperate and then Bill decides to cooperate. So that quantum probability is going to be, we start with uh, Bill's predictions about Stu, that this is Bill's beliefs. We project onto the prediction that Sue's going to cooperate. And then we rotate to the coordinates for Bill's preferences about action. And then we project on the Bill's cooperation subspace to cooperate. So we get the sequence of projections and we ca calculate that probability and we get 0.28, that's this number. This is a typo still, this is a typo. And then uh, uh, we do the same thing the other way around. We, uh, here we're looking at the probability that Bill at first decides to act cooperatively and then predicts that Sue is going to cooperate. So we start with Sue's, we, we start with the Bill's belief state about Sue, Sue's actions. This is predictions for Sue. We project on the prediction that Sue's gonna cooperate. Then we rotate back to the, to the uh, coordinates for Bill's actions, preferences for his actions, and then we project onto the cooperation action, and we get that squared projection, we get that probability. I copied the numbers down wrong right here, so we need to fix that. Anyway, yeah, so this table here is the prediction from the quantum model. This table here is the actually the observed data. But yeah, so when we compute our prediction from our quantum model, in this case, we're, we're computing the prediction for Bill predicting Sue will cooperate and then Bill cooperates. That's this number right here. And then here we're predicting that Bill cooperates and then Bill predicts Sue will cooperate. That's this number right here. Anyway, so that's, it's these sequential probabilities that are really important uh, for testing the model. Now, you might say, okay, you've got to fit a lot of parameters and you can, and you, you can fit you know, these these data sets. And uh, so the model makes some predictions that about these sequential effects, but uh, you know, that's just, that's a lot of model fitting. What about some a priori tests? So that's where we really make an important contribution in our, in our work. So if we take a look at um, now these, these order effects in a little bit more detail, if we take the first table on the left and subtract it from subtract from it the second table on the right, we get this table of differences. And so these are, these are the order effects at the level of the uh, cells. Now, one of the things that quantum theory predicts uh, is that notice that these two diagonal cells, they almost sum to zero. They don't sum exactly to zero, they sum to minus 0.05, but that difference is, that, that, that value is not statistically significant. So basically the sum of the diagonal cells is not statistically different from zero. I'm pretty close to zero, relatively speaking. Well, the quantum model that we just described must always predict that, the, that they're zero. And so that prediction that, that, the, these, or, that these order effects in the joint table, the diagonal sum to zero is a general prediction of the quantum model. And that holds for any kind of state vectors that we predict, choose. Any, any dimension, this is like five dimensional, it could be hundred dimensional any kind of unitary matrix here that we choose, any kind of initial state. Uh, so it's a completely general prediction. So it's a parameter-free, quantitative, and general prediction that the, uh, we call it the QQ equality. The diagonals have to sum up to zero on these, on these order effects. And so that's a very general test of this model. And does this hold up? I mean, this is just one example on the previous page, but let's take a look at it more generally. Well, we've, we've collected data uh, from 72 national surveys that were conducted over 10 years by Pew. These are the surveys with thousands of people. And these surveys included order effect, tests for order effects. 
So this left panel is what we call a QQ, a quantile quantile test, quantile quantile test of order effects. If the, if the null hypothesis is true and there's no order effects, all these blue circles should fall right on this, on this line, this green line here. But you can see that all these blue circles are falling way above the line, they're getting far above the line. That's, and that's showing that there's big order effects, large order effects, much larger than we expect just by statistical noise. But when we turn around and look at the QQ test, remember the Q2 test is supposed to be different, equal to zero. Now, if we take a look at all the blue dots here, they all fall on the line of statistical noise. And so the Q2 test is generally holding up very well, uh, whereas there's large order effects, but the QQ test seems to be satisfied. So we took this as very strong evidence, uh, good evidence, but you know, it doesn't prove it to be true, but it's good evidence that the, this QQ property holds up pretty well uh, when we look at question order effects. Now, uh, you know, one of the challenges though, is once we developed this theory and um, presented it, uh, to, uh, some, some other researchers got interested in this and they came up with some alternative explanations. So there was two, so there's a paper by uh, Keller, Singman and Batchelder and they developed a non-quantum kind of a standard probability explanation for these order effects. And Costello and Watts, they also came up with a uh, standard explanation for these, these effects. Now, but the, but the point I'd like to make here is that we first developed this QQ, like I did, I actually, I actually derived this QQ equality. And then we went, went to the survey data that already existed to see if this, prediction that we made would hold up. So it's an a, it was an a priori test, and we tested it on data that was collected uh, by these Pew National Surveys. So we, it's an a pri strong a priori test. Whereas these people, after they saw our paper and they saw the results, and so they, they developed a post hoc model that could also account for the results. So it's much more post hoc explanation for the results. But it, you know, they also can explain it with these, with these post hoc methods. Okay, now another challenge for this, this order effect is called the um, uh, results that we might that it might be obtained using what's called the, the ABA experiment. This is kind of a judgment and decision-making version of the Stern-Gerlach experiment. And so this is a, a, an issue brought up by Krenikov, Vasieva, Jafarov, and myself. Actually, I was trying to tone down their criticism in this paper. But anyway, here's the issue. So uh, we can ask these questions. Uh, and this is, this is actually a question that occurred in one of the surveys. Do whites dislike blacks? At time one, we asked that, yes or no. And at time two, we asked, well, do blacks dislike whites? Uh, and so that's, we asked that, yes or no. And, and there's big order effects. In fact, you get large order effects when you ask these questions, depending upon the order. But now let's suppose we do an experiment where we ask question A at time one, do whites dislike blacks? Then at time two, we asked the question, do blacks dislike whites? And then at time three, we come back to question A and ask, do whites dislike blacks? That's repeating this question A again. Now, here's the problem is that um, in quantum theory, if we're getting order effects, then what's happening is when we answer this first question, you know, we're projected onto the subspace. Let's say we answer yes. When we answer yes to this first question, then we're projected on the subspace for answer, say, saying yes. If you, and so we're certain to say yes if you ask right again, right after this question, because we're sitting in that subspace for yes to this question. But now when we're asked this question, uh, we're projected onto a different subspace that's oblique, you know, rotated with respect to the first one because we've got order effects that must be uh, rotated to get the order effects. So the second question, we're sitting on yes to the second question, but we're sitting in a subspace that's oblique to this first question. So we're no longer certain to say yes on the first question anymore, because we're certain to say yes on the second question, and we're not, we can't be certain to say yes on both of them because one is rotated with respect to the other. So when we come back to this first question, we're sitting in a subspace that's oblique with respect to the first question. So we should be probabilistic now. So even though uh, we were certain here at the this point in time, the second question is introducing uncertainty. So now we should become uncertain about this first question uh, on a second time. Now, what 
So that's an empirical question. Do people show uncertainty now on the second time that we're repeating this first question? Now, Krennikov, they didn't do the experiment, Krennikov at all, they didn't do the experiment, but they concluded that no, people will never uh, become uncertain here. They'll just give their, they'll just give the same answer again. So they'll always repeat the same answer right here, contrary to our quantum model for question order effects that we just described. But the thing is, our quantum model makes an assumption, though, that uh, there, people are not just going to recall what they, the answer they gave on the first question. That people are really going to go through a, a new judgment on this third on this third time point. Now, people just recall, you know, if they don't bother making the judgment and they just recall, of course, they're just going to write down the answer that they recall. But if they if they actually go through the process of making a new judgment, they might change their answer. So our 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 concern is. How do you do this experiment without people just recalling the previous answer? You know, people have a lot of motivation just to write down the previous answer because when they, if they get to this third point in time and say, well, you just asked this question. And if I'm, I don't want to appear inconsistent. So to, to appear, appear consistent, I'm going to give you the same answer. You know, why are you asking me this question again? So you have to give them some reason for maybe asking this question again. So when we do our experiments, we've always told them, well, now that you've given uh, thought about the second question, what do, you, what do you think about this first question again at this moment? And when, and when we put this statement in here in between, we do get some changes here. We do find some uncertainty here in this third point. But then Krennikov argued, well, putting this statement in between here uh, changes the question here. So we're not asking the same question exactly the third time. So there's a big debate about whether or not people repeat here or they don't repeat here. And we, we try to argue that if you can actually encourage people to make a new judgment, they won't repeat. But Krennikov tries to argue that no, people always repeat. So it's an empirical question still. Now Krennikov did eventually finally develop a quantum model, a very complicated, much more complicated quantum model uh, that can account for all three of these effects assuming that uh, people get order effects and the QQ quality is satisfied and people repeat. But we developed a, a, a version that allows repetition, allows, allows people to repeat or allows them to change their mind on this um, third step. Anyway, that's one of the challenges that we have to face. Now, let's turn to another application, the probability judgment error conjunction fallacy again. So here's another example of the conjunction fallacy. So Jane is in her 20s and she's divorced. You're given this information. And she's assertive and outspoken. She's university educated, well-dressed, and works for a large successful corporation. And her career requires that she travels frequently. And Bill's 34 years old. He's intelligent, but unimaginative and compulsive and generally lifeless. And in school, he was strong in mathematics, but weak in social studies and humanities. So that's your prior information. And then you're asked to make some judgments. And this, these are results from a real experiment. These are uh, uh, from experiment by Gavansky, Roscoe, E. Woltson. And so what they found is on average, when people asked about Jane uh, being an executive, that seems likely they give a high probability 0.7, 8, 4. Uh, when they ask about Bill playing jazz for a hobby, that seems unlikely. They gave a low probability 0.192. Those are fine. But when they're asked about is Jane both an executive and Bill plays jazz for a ho hobby, they give that a higher probability 0.428. That's higher than Bill plays jazz for a hobby. So the conjunction Jane is executive and Bill plays jazz was rated higher than Bill playing jazz. For classical theory, that's impossible because this conjunction is contained in, in the event Bill. I mean, Bill can play jazz and Jane can be an executive or Bill can play jazz and Jane can not be an executive. And so this event here, which contains both possibilities, should be rated higher than this event here, which just contains the, the one combination. So that's called a conjunction fallacy. So, you know, I'm not going to go through all the comp computation, but we can do, model this the same way we did the order effects. So we can have a, a state vector for Jane as an executive, and we can transform it into a, a vector that about Bill being, you know, having different kinds of hobbies. And then we can compute the sequential probabilities. And when we compute the sequential probabilities, the model can reproduce this conjunction fallacy. And so the quantum model 
does a good, maybe let's say, kind of, I think, provide an interesting explanation for conjunction fallacies. Now there's been, so let's, what are the challenges now? Uh, we've, there's been a lot of competing theories to explain these conjunction fallacies. Now, Tversky and Kahneman, who discovered the conjunction fallacy, wrote the initial theory in 1983, uh, and they proposed an idea, a heuristic called the representativeness heuristic. The idea of representativeness heuristic is that when people make probability judgments, they use similarity. So they take the story about Linda and they, they match that story to Linda to bank teller and say, so do the similarity match. And the story about Linda doesn't match the bank teller image very well. And so they give it a low probability. But when they take the story about Linda and match it to what they're thinking about for feminist bank teller, it seems to match better. So they get a higher match. And so this, it's, there seems to be that the story about Linda matches the feminist bank teller better than just bank teller alone. So based upon similarity, it seems like uh, you might get this conjunction fallacy. Well, that explanation based upon the representativeness heuristic is, is, was just left informal, just an in, intuitive explanation, conceptual idea. Whereas we, the quantum model we think provides a um, mathematical, a rigorous way to formalize the representativeness heuristic because the, the stake vector is the, the vector after the story and then the subspace is the, uh, is the event and we're getting this match by the projection. So the square projection is the getting the match of the story to the, to the event. So we, we thought the uh, quantum model provides a nice rigorous way to in, formalize the representativeness heuristic. Now later on, Costello and Watt, Watts presented a theory of, of uh, probability judgments. Now in their theory, they assume that the, there, there's, there's this underlying classical probability theory that underlines everything. However, when people make judgments, they have to sample from memory that's generated by this classical probability theory. And when they generate samples, they may make errors in their, when they're retrieving samples from memory. And so these memory errors are being accumulated and counted up. And so the probability rating is based upon sampling from a classical underlying probability theory. Now, in addition, what they have to assume is that the probability of making an error is larger for conjunctions than it is for single events. And so that's how they get the conjunction fallacy. So they developed that theory. And they also then compared their theory to our theory in a later paper. And they showed that their theory predicts some, some um, probability identity violations uh, that our theory could not predict. So they argued that their theory was superior to our theory because our theory failed to explain some other violations of probability theory, classical, the violations of probability theory come from the sampling mechanism. And so they argued that their sampling theory did better than our quantum theory. However, uh, their theory then was later supplanted by this theory by Jews, Sanborn, and Chater. So Jews, Zhu, Jan, Sanborn, and Chater proposed the Bayesian model. They assume that people have a kind of a Bayesian prior, it's kind of a U-shaped prior over the probability distributions for an event. That's your prior. And then they take samples, like they, they assume sampling like Costell and Watts. But instead of assuming that you're making um, memory errors, they don't assume any kind of memory errors, you're doing a sampling from a classical probability, and then you're computing a posterior probability, taking your prior, which is this, this U-shaped uniform, and combining it with your sample to get a posterior. And the posterior is biased by the prior. And what they assume is, this, is that the sample size is smaller for the conjunction than it is for the single events. And so the bias is larger for the conjunction. And so that's how they get uh, conjunction errors. And now, Jew, Sanborn, and Chater, they quantitatively compared the predictions of their model, Costell and Watts' model, and they found that their model predicted the, uh, a large data set of uh, probability judgments better than Co Costello and Watts's model. So their model is kind of like the, 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 the best model on the, in the field right now. However, we just, we, we in, in light of um, Costello's criticisms, we uh, modified our model to allow for sampling as well. So we're assuming that the underlying generator of samples is a quantum generator rather than a classical generator. So, we, so we're assuming that people are taking samples again, but the underlying samples are coming from a quantum generator. Now, we don't have to assume anything like Costello did that there's you know, more errors in memory 
for the conjunction. And we don't have to assume like uh, Zoo, Sanborn, and Chater that uh, the sample sizes are smaller for the conjunction. We assume the sample sizes are smaller and that there's no errors, but the, all the samples are being generated by a quantum generator. So that's how our theory works. Now we, we did a huge experiment with a thousand participants and they made judgments about who was gonna win in an election between Biden and, and Trump in, in, the, you know, in, in the first election between Biden and Trump. And we looked at events like uh, Biden winning Ohio or Biden winning Michigan. And we looked at all kinds of judgments to make. Like the event A is Biden wins in, Mich in Ohio. Event B is like Biden wins in Michigan. Event not A is Trump winning in Ohio. And event not B is Trump winning in Michigan. And then we have B given A, like Biden winning in uh, Michigan given Biden winning in Ohio. And we had conjunctions like Biden winning in Michigan and Ohio. We also had conjunctions like Biden winning in Ohio and Trump winning in Michigan. So we had all the combinations. And, there, and, and there's in total, people saw 78 different kinds of probability judgments. And they saw them for uh, Michigan and Ohio, and they saw them for Michigan and Missouri, and they saw them for Michigan and Ohio and Missouri. So we had this huge study, a thousand participants, 78 judgments per participant. Um, and what we found in the study, so we did a quantitative comparison of the, um, the Bayesian sequential sampler, the, no, the Bayesian sampler and our quantum sampler. And so we did, and we did the comparison by doing a generalization test. So in, what we do in this generalization test is we first fit the data to all the judgments, except we leave out um, the conjunctions. We leave out the conjunctions. We fit the data to everything except the conjunctions. And then we do it using the parameters fit to the data with everything except the conjunctions. We do a generalization test and see how well the model can predict the conjunctions. And when we do that, we find that the, these are badness of fit measures. These are called um, G squares, which are badness of fit. The badness of fit is a lot larger for the Bayesian model compared to the quantum model. So the quantum model is doing much better. This is better because it's a smaller badness of fit. The quantum model is doing much better on the generalization test when we're testing on the conjunctions, fitting all the data except the conjunctions and then test on the conjunctions. Now, if we turn it around, do it the other way, we fit, it, we fit the data we fit the model to all the data except the disjunctions. We leave out the disjunctions. And then we test the models on the, on the disjunctions. And then we find that the um, uh, quantum model does a, just a little bit worse than the Bayesian model, but not much. They're ba basically equivalent, almost equivalent on the disjunction test. So we find that the quantum model does a lot better on the conjunction test, but uh, and almost the same on the disjunctions test. And so we, we concluded that the the quantum models seems to be doing a lot better than the Bayesian sampler in our new comparison. So this, we hope this, this paper is on the revision for psychological review. I hope it appear there soon. Now, one of the critical things about quantum theory is that you know, our theory requires these order effects. Remember our first discussion about quantum probability theory, the order that you do the measurements makes a big difference. And that's how we're producing these conjunction errors. So we, you know, what is the evidence for order effect for probability judgments? So this is a this was a large study by Jennifer Trueblood, Yearsbly, and Emmanuel Pathos to study order effects on inference. So this is an experiment, for example, where subjects pre presented causes like x one is a cause, and y two is another kind of cause, and they may want to see well when this causes this causal feature is present and this causal feature is present, what's the probability that this effect will occur? And so what we're looking at here is the, the probability that this effect will occur when the feature on X1 is present and feature two on Y is present. And so the probability when X is presented before Y is 0.42. But when we turn around and reverse the order, and now we present feature Y2 first and feature X1 second, we get 0.68. So, we, so reversing the order of the, the causes produces a, a, a huge uh, change in the probability of the effect. So we see these huge order effects in uh, causal reasoning and causal inference. And this is, this is just another example of these huge order effects. And so in fact, so this study is showing, yes, we have large evidence for order effects and probability, 
probabilistic reasoning. Uh, I'm just showing, they did a model comparison. They compared a classical model. This 8D model is basically a classical probability model with, with no order effects. And they compared it to a um, quantum model. The, 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 the smaller the values, the better the model because it's badness. So minus 40 is much better model than the, which is our quantum model to compare to this classical model here. So anyway, that's, a, that's basically showing evidence that there are large order effects in uh, probabilistic judgments. Let's see, let's take a little break here. Okay, let's go back and continue a little bit. Okay, let's take a look at a quite different example. Let's look at some uh, work that we did at irrational decision-making. So in this example, uh, this is a study by a long while ago by Tversky and Shafir. And this study was designed to test uh, uh, a theory of rationality by Jimmy Savage. Jimmy Savage developed a theory called subjective expected utility theory. And it's based on certain axioms. One of the axioms of the subjective expected utility theory is called the sure thing axiom. According to the sure thing axiom, if, un under, if under one state of the world, let's say X, you prefer action A over B, but if under the opposite, under the complement state of the world, not X, you still prefer action A over B, then you should prefer A over B, even if you don't know what the state of the world is. So for example, uh, if, uh, if, 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 if Biden wins the election in November, uh, then you, you, you prefer to buy a house than, rather than not buy the house. And if uh, Biden wins the election in November, and if Biden loses the election in November, and you still prefer to buy the house over not buying the house, then you should go ahead and buy the house now, even before you know the election results. So anyway, the Tversky and Shafir tried to test this with a gambling paradigm. It's called two-stage paradigm. So in this two-stage paradigm, they were first forced to play the first stage of a, of a gamble. They had to play this gamble first time. And this gamble that gave them an equal chance to win $200 or lose $100. Actually, in the real experiment, there's win $2 or lose a dollar. So they had to play the first game, first game. And they didn't, they didn't, you know, so suppose that they won the first, they played the first game, and then they went on to the second stage. Uh, but at the second stage, they're asked, did they want to play again? Do they want to play this gamble a second time? But the, under three conditions. Under the first condition, they said, well, suppose you won this first game. Do you want to play again after you know you won the first game? Or suppose you lost the first game. Do you want to play again if you know you lost? Or the third condition was, uh, do you want to play again without even knowing what happened in the first stage? So we had these three conditions. And what they found was when person, people were told they won the first game, 65% wanted to play again. Most people wanted to play again. And when they were told they lost the first stage, 55% of the people wanted to play again. So the majority of people wanted to play again, regardless of whether they win or lose. But when they didn't know what the outcome in the first stage, only 35% wanted to play again. So they concluded that this was some evidence against the sure thing principle. In fact, a, a very common pattern was subjects first deciding they'd play again after win and deciding to play again after they lost. But then the same subject would decide not to play again in the unknown condition. So, and this is a violation of total probability because the, the total probability of playing uh, when you don't know, well, that should just be some average of these two. So the probability that you play when you don't know should be, well, what's the probability that you will win times 65% plus the probability that you think you're going to lose times 55%. And that average should be someplace in between 65 and 55. The 35 is falling way below the average. So the total probability prediction you should be someplace in between the two, but in fact, you fall below the average. Well, we developed a quantum model to explain these effects. And I'm not going to be able to go through the quantum model on this because it's well, we run out of time and it's kind of complicated. But let me just describe uh, our success with the model. Now, on the left-hand side here, I've got the actual empirical results. On the right-hand side, these two panels, I've got the predictions of the quantum model. But on the left-hand side, one thing we found that, well, if you look at the literature, actually, people have had trouble replicating this, uh, this, this, uh, this effect that Tversky and Shafir found. They had trouble replicating it. And we, what we discovered was, well, it turns out this effect depends upon order. It's, there's an order effect going on here. 
So now for, in this panel here, we did the experiment where, where subjects first, we, we had a thousand subjects in the study again, so we got a large number of subjects, but half the subjects were first shown the known information and then they were given the unknown. And so here we're looking at, um, and on the x-axis here, we have the risk of the gamble. So the gamble is increasing in risk, you know, how much you can win and lose. So we've got increasing risk here. And this axis, the y-axis, the probability to take the gamble. And so what we're seeing here is if we get a replication of the Tversky and Shafir result. When you, wanna, when you know you win, there's a higher chance of playing the gamble again. When you know you lost, there's a higher chance of knowing you play the gamble again. But when you don't know, it drops down below the two. So that's our just that's our, our violation of total probability. These probabilities are falling below uh, the winning and the losing. That, that's, in a sense, replicating the finding of the verse in 92. But when we reverse the order, we get the opposite effect. So here's the probability when you know you win, it's down below. Here's the probability when you know you lost, it's down below. And when you don't know, it's now it's rising above. And so when you, if you average across these two orders, you get no effect. So the order effect seems to be highly dependent, the, uh, the, the violation of total probability is highly dependent on the order. It changes directions. Here we got a violation of total probability, it's too high. Here we got a violation of total probability, total probability, it's too low. So that's the empirical result. And we developed a quantum model uh, to, and you can see that the quantum model accurately reproduces this, the, the, the violation of total probability and the reverse in direction depending upon order. And uh, we compared this quantum model to a Markov model, the logistic utility model. Logistic utility model is built upon ideas that Tversky used to, expound, to explain the first effect when the total probability is violated by falling too low. But that model couldn't, can't explain the, the opposite result when it's too high. So that model did, this is badness of fit. So the logistic utility model did really poor. We also constructed a Markov model that was parallel to the quantum model. Uh, in both of these models, they could, they could produce order effects because they allow the starting position of the state to change depending upon the order that you um, receive the measurements or the order that you receive the information. Like here, this is the order that you are given known information first. This is the order that you're doing the uncertain infer task first. And both the Markov and the quantum model were given different prior states depending upon this order. But the quantum model still did much better than the, the Markov model. The Markov model cannot really produce this violation of total probability. Anyway, so, so briefly then what we're showing here is this quantum, our quantum model does a nice job on this completely different kind of effect, this, um, this irrational decision-making study uh, showing violations of total probability. Now let's turn to another kind of uh, application, uh, well, an application to what we call the categorization decision-making task. So this, this categorization decision-making task was first developed by Jim Townsend, but we later uh, examined it in more detail and further to study uh, uh, violations of total probability again. So in this task, people are shown faces. Some of the faces are narrow faces. This happens to be one of the narrow faces. And some, some of the faces are wide faces. Now the narrow faces, were, you know, in the experiment, the subjects were trained so that the narrow faces, they would, would they learned to expect that the narrow faces were tend to be bad guys and you should attack them. And the wide faces, they were trained, uh, the wide faces, they were trained so that the wide faces were tend to be good guys and you should be friendly to them. So, so in this experiment, after training, we would test them, we tested them, but we tested them under two different conditions. Under one condition, we, we asked them to categorize the face first and then decide the action. So they would see a face, they categorize it as good or bad, and then take an uh, attack or withdrawal, or act, act friendly or attack aggressive decision. And then we give them feedback. Under the decision alone condition, they see a face and then they just decide to, to attack or withdrawal, or decide to attack or be friendly or aggressive. So they didn't make any categorization here. So, and what we're interested in is what's the total probability of the decision when you first categorize versus the probability of the decision when you didn't categorize. We want to compare those two and, and the difference in the total probabilities ref, 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 uh, reflects the uh, an interference effect, what we, what we call an interference effect of categorization on decision-making. It's a violation of total probability. Now this experiment actually uh, is an example of a, 
kind of like a two slit experiment. In the see then D condition, uh, you, we can observe which hole you're going through before you make your decision. But the D alone condition, you know, we don't observe which hole you're going through. And so the, uh, the path is unobserved in the D alone condition. So it's kind of like a two slit experiment in physics, if you're familiar with that. But anyway, here are the results of the experiment. So for, we got the results from the, from the wide faces, the good guy faces, and we got the results for the narrow faces, bad guy faces. So for the good guy faces, we get these from the categorization and decision condition, the C and then D condition, we get these results for these four first columns. So we get the probability, you say it's a good guy, it's a high probability because it's a good face. The probability you attack him in good guy, it's a low probability because you think it's a good guy. And the probability it's a bad face is low probability. This, these two sum up to one. Probably, it's a low probability you think it's a bad guy. And the probability attack given the bad guy, it's a higher probability because it's you think it's a bad guy. And so the total probability is we multiply the probability of good guy times the probability of attack given good guy plus the probability of bad guy, probability of attack given bad guy, and you get the total probability. So that's the just in a, in a way, in a simple in a simpler way to understand it. It's just if we just ignore the categorization response altogether and just sum across trials, the overall probability of attacking uh, is then 0.37. Now, in the, we compare that. Here's the decision alone condition. In the decision alone condition, the probability of attacking is 0.39. So they came out pretty close in the uh, case of um, the good, good guy faces. But in the case of the bad guy faces, we get a big difference. So the total probability from the categorization and decision, the total probability to attack is 0 0.59. That's the, that's the total probability of attacking under the C then D condition. Under the decision alone condition, this second condition here, the probability of attacking is 0.69, much higher. And so the probability of attacking when you don't categorize is much higher than the probability of attacking when you've categorized first. So somehow categorizing first lowers your probability of attacking. Well, it's even interesting in this, this data, in this experiment, the probability of attacking when you haven't made up your mind about good guy or bad guy is even higher then the probability of attacking when you decide it's a bad guy. Here you did the category decision task, categorization first, you decide it's a bad guy, but the probability of attacking given you decide it's a good, bad guy is 0.63, is lower than the probability of attacking when you didn't even make up your mind. Now this, this difference here, we don't always find. I mean, we often find these two numbers to be closer together, but this difference here, we do always generally find. So that's been replicated. So, so we built a quantum model to account for this categorization decision interference effect. It's kind of like a two slit interference effect. It's a violation of total probability. Well, but, but and we did a larger experiment. So I did this experiment with Rob Nosofsky and my, and my student here, Jung, Wong Jung. And we did a large experiment. So we had a, a wide range of faces that we use. So these narrow faces tend to be, tend to be the bad guys and these wide faces tend to be the good guys. So on this horizontal axis, I have face width. And on the vertical axis, I have different kinds of probabilities. So um, this, this blue line here is the probability that you say it's a bad guy. And so there's a high probability you say it's a bad guy when it's narrow and it goes down. And there's a low probability you say it's a bad guy when it's a wide face, because those are the good guys. So that's the probability of categorization. And then this red line is the probability that you attack across the different, given, given that you've categorized it as a bad guy. So it's a probability attack given categorized as a bad guy. And it goes down a little bit when it's, when it's a good phase, but it's generally high because you, you categorize it as a bad guy. And here's the probability attack when you say it's a good guy, it's generally low. And then the total probability when you pull across these, these three, the blue and the red and the green, you get the total probability. That's this um, total probability is this lighter blue curve right here. And then the probability of, a, of attacking on the decision alone, when you didn't categorize, is the black dark curve. And the shaded area is the uh, interference effect or the violation of total probability. So we're getting these violations of total probability across the, the different face widths. <clears throat> now this is, so this is a large data set that we collected. This is just data on this left-hand panel here. So actually we have three groups, so we had, three of these panels. So we have this large data set with lots of conditions. And, and we, we want to test our model against the best model in the field for categorization. The best model in the field for categorization is the exemplar model, now the, developed by Nosovsky. 
Now the exemplar model was originally developed just for categorization and not for making a sequence of, of responses like a categorization and decision. So Nosowski had to extend the uh, exemplar model to include a sequence of categorizing and deciding. But anyway, it was one of the best models in the field. It's an outstanding model really for categorization. And we tried to compare uh, the fits, quantitative fits of the exemplar model to our quantitative model. Uh, and we did it with the aggregate data pulling across all the subjects, but we also did it at the individual data level on the folks here on this table for the individual level data. In this bottom line here, I'm showing here. Uh, so we had actually two different experiments, three different groups. Which what I'm showing here is the proportion of people better fit by the quantum model than the exemplar model. And we see that for group one, 83% uh, are better fit by the quantum model than the exemplar model. Group two, 87% are better fit by the quantum model than the exemplar model. And group three, it's 80%. That's experiment one. We got similar results for experiment two, except for group three, the exemplar model did better in group three than the quantum model. But generally speaking, the exemplar, the quantum model was beating out the, the exemplar model and the exemplar model is one of the best models in the field for categorization. Now, actually, when you look at the quantitative, quantitative differences, the models are making pretty similar predictions. And so you know, the, 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 the difference between the models is ra rather small, even though the percentages are favoring the quantum model. So I don't wanna to argue too strongly that we're, we're doing a whole lot better than the exemplar model. But I, I would just wanna argue that, well, at least the quantum model is being competitive and doing a good competitive job competing with one of the best models in the field in this quant categorization decision-making task. Now let's, let's take a look at another uh, interesting phenomenon. This is measurement context effects. So this is uh, some results done by my colleague, Peter Bruza. So this is looking at the questions effects. So we're gonna be looking at, you know, people are showing a picture of a face and then they're asked pairs of questions. And so what we're gonna see is how the interpretation of a question depends on the context that's in. So Peter looked at three different contexts. So people would see this face and then they were asked a question. Do you think it's trustworthy? Do you think this face is trustworthy and intelligent? So they could say yes or no, it's trustworthy and yes or no, it's intelligent. So you get a two by two table here. So here we have two by table, two table, two by two table for trustworthy and intelligent. The, the columns are the trustworthy, the rows are intelligent. So the cell right here, those are people saying, yes, the face is intelligent, and yes, the face is trustworthy, 0.24. This number here is no, the face is not intelligent, and yes, the face is trustworthy. And, and this here is the Yes, the face is intelligent and it's not trustworthy. This number here, this cell, this cell here is no, the face is not intelligent and no, the face is not trustworthy. So that's a two by two table for trustworthy intelligent. And then he asked, well, is this face showing dominance and intelligence? So this is the table, is it dominant, domineering face and intelligent? And then this third table is a table where we have trust in it and domineering, trust and domineering. So we can look at, you know, what happens to the, let's take a look at the marginal probability of, that somebody thinks that the person's intelligent in the context of being asked about trust. So when they're asking about intelligence in the context of trust, this face looks, they only get 0.36. But when they ask about intelligence in the context of dominance, the intelligence goes up to 0.7. So we get this huge order effect about intelligence depending upon you're asking in the context of trust versus domineering. If we look at the same thing, if we ask about intelligence, no, that's looking at intelligence, the context of trust and domineering. If we look at the marginal probability of looking at how trustworthy the person is, trustworthy in the context of intelligence and trustworthy in the context of domineering, in the context of do trustworthiness in the context of intelligence is 0.66, but trustworthiness in the context of domineering is 0.38. So we get these huge effects of context effects on choice. Now, Peter didn't develop a quantum model to account for these effects, but these kinds of context effects are exactly what uh, quantum models were designed to account for. So this is called a, a measurement context effect. Uh, now, this is not one of the interesting ones where you get uh, violations of Bell inequality under the conditions of no signaling. There's, there's signaling going on here. So it's not like a, there's a more dramatic contextual effect 
where you get the marginals stay the same, but the correlations are too strong and you violate uh, classical probability because of the strength of the correlations. Uh, here we're looking at violations of classical probability because the margins are changing. But anyway, it's still quantum theory can account for these, these contextual effects, whether the margins are changing or the correlations are too strong. Well, so we're, I've been going on quite a bit of time now and uh, I can't go through all the applications. We have many more applications in quantum probability theory to similarity judgments, conceptual combinations. Like these are like, you know, how good is Apple? How strongly is that? How strong is the membership of Apple to the category of fruit? For example, that would be uh, how strong is the uh, combination Apple and mm, corn to, the, con to uh, the membership of fruit? You know, those kind of things. Uh, and when we talked about categorization, and then there's also applications of quantum theory to memory recognition. So those are different applications. And um, now, uh, well, I was thinking about uh, extending this talk to quantum dynamics, but I'm, I'm getting tired and you must be getting tired too. So I'm, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to skip over the quantum dynamics and uh, skip over to, um, uh, to the end of this talk. So let me get to the end get to the uh, final statement here. Um, let me just say, uh, yeah, final st st statement here. The future of quantum science is filled with endless possibilities. And we currently stand on the threshold of a new dawn, a new era of science and technology. Quantum science is more than just a subject. It is the key to changing the future, a key to unlocking the mysteries of the universe. Quantum science is the next giant leap in technology that will lead us into unpre unprecedented era in which wonders beyond the classical world will become a reality. We must emphasize the importance of quantum science as a frontier field and its enormous potential for technology, science, and human understanding of the natural world. So yeah, so who made, who made these uh, fancy statements? You know, was it, was it Bohr? Was it, was it Einstein? No, probably not Einstein. Was it um, Dirac or um, von Neumann or Feynman? Does Feynman often makes these big statements? Well, no, it wasn't any of these people. It was my wife. <laughs> it's my wife is real. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna thank these people that have worked with me all these years and then I'll stop here and ask.